The following is a hoop ball presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. The Tour of Texas continues here on this Wednesday edition of Fantasy NBA Today. I am Dan Bespris. Thanks, as always, for tuning in. This show is Hoop Ball Presentation. Hoop-Ball.com is the website. At Hoop Ball Fantasy on Twitter. Yes, tis indeed your Hoop and Ball Fantasy. Check it out. Cool stuff going on over at Hoop Ball. Wanted to start the show by reminding everybody we do still have things going on at our main homepage. Uh, the great Mike Pasador has an article out on Buddy Heald, covering Buddy Heald and the Sacramento Kings, which is really good stuff. And honestly, anything that Mike writes is just freaking gold, regular or fantasy-wise. This happens to be a fantasy article. Uh, I mentioned it before, Steve Vidovich breaking down the San Antonio Spurs and our live studio crew. <laughs> By studio, I, of course, mean various basements across the country. Uh, they'll be putting out a stream this evening, a live show on YouTube, breaking down the 2014 NBA draft, the real one, not fantasy draft. That should be a lot of fun, uh, a lot of names that you will recognize on that show. We have a couple of those live shows every week. They are all free during this NBA shutdown. Everything we do is free right now. Uh, so check it out. I mean, I know we're all kind of sports starved. It's a fun way to just talk with folks about sports and things that, do they have any relevance to the current fantasy landscape? Not really. But you know what? It's new, and it's interesting, and uh, just taking a new look at an old thing. As I mentioned, the Tour of Texas, we're into the Southwest Division right now. We covered the Houston Rockets on yesterday's show, which I believe is arguably the second easiest team in the NBA to break down behind the Los Angeles Lakers. Today, we'll move towards other teams in the Southwest Division, which overall is actually, I believe, one of the more difficult divisions to handicap. And it just so happened that they had the Rockets. We knocked out the easy one first. I know we're not on a normal uh, Monday through Friday post-mortem schedule right now. That is, we're not doing the five teams in a division five days of the week. We're sort of bumped off kilter. But it'll all round itself back out again by the end of this process. The math of it makes sense. Uh, the Last Dance, of course, aired on Sunday. We'll have two episodes of that each of the next four Sundays as well. And that'll... Because we're going to be doing a show on Mondays, breaking down lessons learned from a season gone by and the most recent two episodes of The Last Dance, by the time all five of those Sundays are done, those five shows will push us back to a normal Monday through Friday team-by-team -team breakdown routine right around the time that we're actually finishing up the team-by-team -team breakdown. So let's dive right on into the San Antonio Spurs. We will, as per usual, start at the top and work our way down the list. And the number one fantasy player on the Spurs is, once again this year, LaMarcus Aldridge. An old man, Bespris staple. You guys know how much I love LaMarcus and his unbelievably predictable fantasy game. He is a nine-category warrior. Just 1.4 turnovers per game this year. He was drafted 45.4. That was his ADP this season. Dramatically outperforming that number, uh with eight averages of 19 points, seven and a half rebounds, which is one of the lowest numbers of his career, but uh, seemingly just didn't feel the, the intense desire to go for those, was setting a career high in blocks this season right at 1.6, right on his career mark at 0.7 steals per game. Free throw percent was uh, above his career mark, but actually a tiny bit below where he had been for the better part of the last five or six years. And field goal percent was a tiny bit down although not that far off of uh, some of his seasons in, in San Antonio. As far as the sort of LaMarcus discussion needs to go, it's basically just that he's older. That's the whole story with him. He's born in 1985. He's one of the NBA players that's not that much younger than me, which brings me a weird measure of solace. Uh, he'll be turning, I can do the math on this, 35 in about three months give or take a couple of days. So by the time the next season starts, he'll be a 35-year-old. You have to figure there is some built-in decline here. But looking at the numbers from this season, you could argue one of the reasons his his field goal percent was down is an increase in three-pointers. He attempted a career-high three 
threes per game and hit him at a 39% clip. So those were at 1.2 this year. But otherwise, things were fairly standard for LaMarcus. There wasn't much of a drop-off. He didn't have to rebound quite as hard with sort of big guards on San Antonio. Jante Murray, uh, DeMar DeRozan each grabbed close to six rebounds a game. Rudy Gay, Trey Lyles, Jakob Pertl, all of those guys were in the five neighborhood. And the Spurs just, as a team, didn't have that one big rebounding force. Yes, LaMarcus had some games mixed in where he grabbed a bunch of rebounds. I mean, most recently... Uh, right before the All-Star break, he had a 25-14 and 14 game. But overall, he was seemingly less inclined to go in there and beat up on folks and instead just do some boxing out and you know, rebounds fall where they may. I don't think we can take away a ton from this year. Uh, his field goal volume was down, which was uh, one, I would call that a negative. But one of the things you're getting with LaMarcus, and you know there was a little bit of a drop-off in this department. The Spurs uh, had played 63 games to this point in the season. LaMarcus had played in 53 of them, so he did miss some games here and there. Uh, had an issue earlier in the season that kept him out for a couple weeks, and then there were some rest days blended in. So not great to see him miss about 15-ish or so percent of his team's games to this point. That puts him around the 70, 69, 70 mark for the entire season which would be generally down for him after a stretch where he played 71 or more games in five consecutive seasons, culminating last year in a whopping 81 games on the season. He was, prior to that injury earlier this season, LaMarcus was in first-round value discussion because he had been trucking along prior to missing a couple of games. You know, he missed about a week in December. Basically, with him, you had a couple of different spots where he missed about a week of basketball, and overall, that added up to about 10 games missed overall. So, I mean, most recently, he missed two weeks. Uh, Yeah, almost exactly two weeks before playing in one game prior to the season getting suspended. So, LaMarcus, by totals, he was number 31. That was a little bit of a setback because the games missed. Again, by averages, he was at 26. And I think it's one of those situations where you can build in a tiny bit of drop-off on a season-by-season basis. I think, you know, if you assume he's back in San Antonio with a similar role next year, the, the blocks were probably... Uh, I, I don't know if I would call those sustainable. I would have said that I thought they were going to drop off at some point this year, but they stayed well above his career mark. They didn't come down. He signed again next season for $24 million. I would venture to guess that he's probably going to take that money. We're seeing what big guys can make, and he'll be 35 years old. But I guess you never know, and there's always the possibility that he gets moved during the season next year. But anybody that trades for Aldridge is going to use him in a pretty large fashion. So I think you're looking at a guy that is kind of the same story that he has been in the past. He was number, again, 26 this year on a per-game basis, just quietly doing his business. He was 25 last year, frightfully consistent, no buzz, drafted it towards the end of the fourth round in a lot of drafts, and even with the missed games, still well exceeded that mark. He was an early third-round pick by averages. He was a mid-to-late third-round pick by totals. And again, he was drafted in the fourth. So either way, you crushed it. And if he doesn't suffer this two-and-a-half-week injury right before the season gets suspended, he was coasting along at an early second-round pace prior to that. What's the lesson to be learned from LaMarcus Aldridge? I don't think there is one. I think sometimes you just go with the guys with portfolio, and until they give you an indicator that they're starting to fade, which he might at some point, but again, he's not quite the banger he used to be. Until you get that indicator that things are fading, you just kind of keep coasting along and taking the easy value in nine-category leagues. And I know he's less exciting in eight-category leagues because the turnovers are part of his his built-in value on the year, but he's just decent in a lot of stuff. Uh, He was very good in blocks this year. Again, we mentioned better than usual in that department. And even though the volume was down a little bit, the other stuff settled into place. Of course, LaMarcus Aldridge's value is to some degree tied to what's going on with DeMar DeRozan. When he misses basketball games, LaMarcus Aldridge has a much larger burden on his shoulders and vice versa. 
those are the two guys doing the intense heavy lifting in terms of volume on the offensive side of the basketball. DeRozan was at 16 shots with almost seven free throws a game. LaMarcus Aldridge was at 15, and nobody else was over nine and change. Admittedly, there were a few guys in that neighborhood, but that's part of the problem with this team and part of the solution because both of these guys are potential trade candidates if the Spurs decide they do want to kind of blow things up. DeMar DeRozan has a player option for about $28 million for next year that we would assume he's taking given, again, all of the what we're hearing. Again, I'm not a capologist over here. I don't know how it's all going to play out. I don't know how revenue is going to change. But with all the games being missed, most likely this year, I have to think that that's going to bring the salary cap down. So guys that have an opportunity to take these inflated player options, this, the contracts that were signed when everything was just gravy pre-coronavirus, they're probably going to take it and cash in. So if both of those guys are there in San Antonio, there isn't a giant reason to think their roles change all that much other than both each, however you want to grammatically present it, getting one year older. And for Aldridge, that's a bigger deal than DeRozan, but it's a thing for both of these guys. DeMar born in 89, so he's very much at the front end of the downslope. LaMarcus Aldridge is already kind of in the middle of it. So DeRozan, number 43 on the season by averages, played in 61 of their 63 games, and he's another uh, interesting case study in... Guys that generally play in their team's games. He was drafted about 45th. His ADP was 45th. He's had two seasons in his long career where he didn't really play in almost every single ball game. And while I'm not overly enthused with his fantasy profile, there's actually a lot to like about DeRozan that kind of now, because he's sort of been this same quiet, whatever you want to call it, for so long... He now kind of flies under the radar. Three, four years ago, right when Hoopball was getting started, you guys probably remember me on this podcast saying, yeah, I don't really care. I don't really care for DeMar DeRozan. And at that point, he was averaging 27 points and five boards in Toronto, and everybody was spending their their 35th, 40th pick on him. But he didn't hit any three-pointers. His defensive stats have, throughout his entire career, not been all that impressive. The assists were fine, but unspectacular. The rebounding was also fine, but unspectacular. And his field goal percent was in the mid-40s at that point. Well, things have actually changed with DeRozan. And even though his volume has come down just due to age and situation and pace of play on San Antonio versus Toronto, his efficiency has been crazy high. He's gone back to not taking any three-pointers, and he shot 53% from the field this year. That's far and away a career high, and way over his career mark, coming off of a season last year where he shot 48% for the year. And so I think there's... Now, 53 is probably the high watermark. I don't know that he can do that again next year. Maybe he can. Perhaps this is the new normal. I'm more inclined to believe that 48 was sort of the you know, the middle of an ascent towards 49, perhaps. But you're probably looking next year at more in that high 40s. I don't think he's going to drop back into the low 40s anymore. I think he's he's sort of beyond that stage of his career. The shot selection has just gotten improved, but he still gets to the free throw line. He still makes him at a very high clip. San Antonio doesn't have any big bulk rebounding guy, so he's up near six there. He's taken on a lot of point guard duties with this team, and he's averaged close to six assists per game with the Spurs. Turnovers haven't really gone up. Steals and blocks have stayed pretty much the same. And so you get this efficiency bump. You guys know I love defensive stats and I love percentages. And through most of his career, Aldridge, or excuse me, uh, DeRozan was just free throw percent of those four categories. And now he's added field goal percent as well as a guy you can get in the late fourth round and will probably plod along with fourth round per game value, but as usual, unbelievably durable. He's number 18 by totals this year. He was 33 by totals last year. You can just go back and back and back and just keep going. And everywhere you look with DeMar DeRozan, 30 the year before that in Toronto because he played in 80 basketball games, 39 the year before that. 
So he very rarely hits his ADP on a per game basis. He's in fact that's not entirely fair. He's often almost spot on his ADP and you know usually within about a round or a half round of that mark. He's getting drafted in the mid 40s, he usually ends up somewhere in that like 38 to 50 range on a per game basis. But when you're playing 74 to 80 games every single year and nobody else is playing that many anymore, you get a bump. You get a bump. And so he actually now tends to beat his ADP by totals. The Spurs are an intensely boring fantasy team. An intensely boring fantasy team. There is no disputing that assessment of what they've done out there. But, but, sometimes boring is okay. These guys do just enough in enough categories. They don't hurt you anywhere. And they're consistently underdrafted because San Antonio is boring. Because their fantasy games have grown boring in the modern era. They're not spacing the floor. They're not going crazy with anything. Defensive stats are not that wild. That nobody wants them anymore. We'll take them. We'll let them fall on us. That's totally fine. What no one will ever really know, unless I mention it, and I decided I will, is that right after that moment, everything went out over here on my end. TV, internet, you name it. We lost it all. So there was actually an odd break. I don't remember what I was talking about. I listened back to the podcast at this point, and now we will pick up from this exact moment. It's funny to me, in listening back to the show to this point, we're 15 to 16 minutes in or so, talking almost exclusively about two of the most boring fantasy players in the entire NBA. But, it, you know, it, to me, I don't think the the vast majority of our time should necessarily be spent talking about the buzziest of the buzzy names when we're always value hunting. We have to be value hunting. That is the name of the game. And so when you isolate values, when you isolate guys that are almost definitely going to either be accurately or underdrafted, you can set them up on your board and probably get a lot of them next year. Now, Many of you, like me, are in multiple leagues. I try not to go too crazy. I have, I think, five money leagues, so that's what I'm really honed in on. The free leagues, I do my best. You know, we got the 30 deep. That one's for bragging rights, you know, top pros in the industry out there. The the money ones, of course, the ones that dictate what sort of new equipment I can buy for my, my actual home office at the end of the fantasy year, this is this is where we're isolating. And so, you know, in those five different leagues or whatever you guys might have, you're probably going to have five different draft positions. So you're not going to be able to get the same guys in every single one. But if you understand that a guy like a LaMarcus Aldridge or a DeMar DeRozan, and I think, honestly, I think Aldridge is probably the the best name to look at right now, is if you're in a league with a bunch of hoop ball guys, they might go a little bit earlier. You know, you're probably in a league with some folks that are maybe you're maybe you're in a league with other folks that listen to this podcast. He went at 33 in one of my leagues. I was hoping he would get back to me. I took Chris Paul actually at 32 in that league, knowing that between those two guys, he was the one I wanted more. I was hoping Aldridge would get back to me in the fourth round. He didn't. So if you're in a league that employs people that are lasered in on hoop ball stuff, you're probably going to see Aldridge go a little bit sooner. He went at 37 in my other league that has uh, a number of hoop ball guys in it. And then I have a keeper league where everybody's all discombobulated and a couple of sort of weirdly like, goofball head-to-head leagues that don't really... I mean, a lot of a lot of teams punt turnovers in head-to-head. So... You know, a guy like an Aldridge is probably going to fall a little bit farther in that spot. Uh, actually, interestingly enough, he went at 37 in that one as well. So, you know, the ADP, we know what it said. It said mid-40s for LaMarcus. It actually said 45. He and DeRozan actually went back-to-back back if you're going by ADP numbers. And sure, he, he went earlier than that because, well, number one, there are eight category results intermingled. And number two... I happen to think I'm in fairly competitive leagues where in nine category spots, you're going to see him go a little bit sooner than that. So you, you have to do mock drafts. This is why it's important to do mocks 
with people that have a similar dedication level to the ones that you're playing with, find out where a guy's actually going. You're probably going to learn that a guy like Aldridge is going to go closer to, you know, 37 to 40 as opposed to 45. DeRozan probably going to go closer to that 45 mark. He's just, he's, in fact, he went in the sixth round in one of my drafts. He went at 64 in a draft that I was in. And this is, you know, part of an impact that we have here in the, in the Fantasy Pro podcasting community, the impact that we have on numbers. But it's also just the impact of boring fantasy games. Next highest player on the Spurs list was DeJounte Murray, who ended up at number 71 after this up and down and all around fantasy season. Played much better as the year went on. His minutes trended up over his last roughly 23 games. He was number 63. That was starting eh, around January. And then it actually got better for him after that. Murray averaged 27 and a half minutes over the last three weeks, roughly, of the fantasy season, and he was a top 50 guy in that span. There are a few things in that stretch that are unsustainable, such as the magic of a small sample size. LaMarcus Aldridge missed a lot of those games that allowed him to just simply do more. Oddly enough, DeMar DeRozan didn't ratchet up his volume all that much during that particular span. It, it sort of got split around, and DeJounte Murray ended up doing a lot of the extra lifting. He also had one of his higher stretches of minutes played during that span. And this was the guy that I think everybody was hoping for to start the year. But as you look back at the season for Murray, you know, you you can't help but take it in chunks. Right? You just, how do you, how do you, how do you reconcile that? You can't. So, you know, you go with, say, the first two months of the season, and he was number 83. So he was fine in that, in that situation. And then, oh, I don't know, you go to, say, the next two months of the season, and you just do it in chunks and figure out where he was, and he was number 78 in that range. But his minutes were very slowly trending up. Remember, he was coming off of a, a key injury, so you knew there was going to be a slow ramp up here. And he's another case of a guy that I think people are going to feel worse about than they actually should. Those of you that listened to this podcast last offseason, you know I said I want nothing to do with either of the two point guards in San Antonio on draft day. Derek White was kind of on and off of my fantasy team during the year. We were trying to catch him on hot streaks when guys were out. It looked like he was beginning to turn a corner at certain junctures and then sort of didn't at others. But DeJounte Murray... In his, in his weird way, who, by the way, you know, his ADP was relatively, and I say high, as in he was drafted at a, a, a pretty high clip earlier than I would have expected, given the fact that he was going to be battling people. He was kind of a seventh, eighth round type of guy. He actually ended up outperforming that particular ADP. Pretty interesting, right? I don't think that if you just glanced at it, if you were just like, oh, how did Jonathan Murray do this year? Someone would say it was a strange year for him. He ended up averaging over the course of the season 58 games, I should say. So he missed five. 11 points, almost. Half a three-pointer, six boards, four assists, 1.7 steals. 0.3 blocks, 47 and a half from the field. 80 at the free throw line, relatively low turnovers as the point guard, but not really the lead ball handler. That was DeMar DeRozan for most of the time he was on the floor. Now couple of notes on DeJounte Murray. First, I'll say this. I think he could end up being an interesting draft day value next year, even in a timeshare with Derek White. Because I don't know that either of these guys is going to get moved. It doesn't seem like there's a reason to. They're both on pretty affordable contracts. Derek White uh, still on his, I believe he's still on his rookie deal, if I'm not mistaken. So he's signed for next year. And then there's a... You can, they can give him the QO. He's a restricted free agent the year after that. DeJounte Murray is a little bit more locked in. He's signed through the 2023-24 season. So, by all accounts, it seems like these guys aren't going anywhere. 
there's a tiny bit of upside with the idea that maybe San Antonio thinks about a rebuild and they jettison one or both of their high-volume guys in Aldridge and DeRozan, in which case Murray would slide into a very large role. And then there's a the little bit of upside that maybe San Antonio finally just says, ah, bleep it, and they finally play Murray and White together. We don't know that any of those things is actually going to be the case. We'll operate just under the assumption that Murray makes the same small steps forward that any young-ish basketball player should, and we'll assume that the team stays makeup-wise relatively similar season over season. So let's, for our hypothetical, as we plan ahead, just assume Aldridge and DeRozan are still there, assume they're chewing up most of the usage, assume Aldridge gets one year older, DeRozan does the same, Murray gets a tiny bit better, so his role should take a small step forward. Again, I think, I believe pretty strongly that if you asked most people in the fantasy community, without looking at the numbers, how do you think DeJounte Murray did this year? I think most people would say top 100 kind of year. Just at a glance. Maybe the teams that had him will say top 75 because they were paying attention. But if you were not a Murray owner or rosterer, I don't like the term owner for this stuff, if you didn't roster DeJounte Murray, if you didn't draft him and keep him all year, you probably saw those very up and down, ultra inconsistent fantasy lines, particularly the first couple months of the year. And in your head, you said, this guy's not doing much. And his minutes were all over the map and he was resting back to backs. And then things, I don't want to say they clicked as the season went along, but it was a very slow, almost linear growth process throughout the year where he just got a little bit better every couple of weeks, a little bit more comfortable and consistent. And by the end, he was trucking. He was trucking. The upside is capped a little bit because generally not a massively high usage guy, although that was coming up a little bit towards the end of the year. Upside capped a little bit because DeMar DeRozan had been kind of the primary assist guy. Upside a little bit capped because he doesn't take three-pointers and... There isn't really enough evidence to say that he can be useful at the free throw line. Career 74 percenter, although 80 this year, so maybe, maybe. But there is some upside with the idea that if his volume increases, then everything good comes with it. More points, more assists, more impact. He's a good field goal percent guy from a point guard spot. And you just find your three-pointers other well, uh, elsewhere. I could be wrong. I could be totally wrong. I'm just, you know, we're spitballing here a little bit as we break down a season gone by. I think DeJounte Murray doesn't get the hype he deserves going into next year's fantasy draft. I think everybody thought big things this year coming off of injury. There was a lot of buzz around his name. And then he sort of semi-delivered. So I think he might be a draft day value next year. If he takes even a small step forward, you're talking about a top 60 guy. So that's a first five rounds kind of dude. Meaning you could take him in the sixth, you know, pick 65, pick 70. And he could actually hit that mark. And you just hope that there's a durability now that he's over the big injury. Remember, he missed an entire season of basketball. He didn't play a single game last year. Interestingly, he played 81 the year before that. Played 58 this year through 63 games. So I don't know. It's tough to say. I mean, you you say, is there a a freak element to the injury? Yeah, those big ones, probably. You know, he looked pretty good, healthy out there this season. So I'm not going to doubt him going forward. I think you might even be able to say that he's got a little bit of that durability in him. As a young guy, not a huge leaper, just a long dude. They can jump. I mean, all these guys can jump, but in any event. Derek White ended up at number 128. And after we talk about him, we'll just sort of blitz through a couple of peripheral names on the Spurs. Derek White had... 
as up and down a season as DeJounte Murray and then even more up and down because with Murray, it was like sloping up and then sloping down and sloping up. And with, with White, it was like peak valley, peak valley. He was all over the damn map this season. And it was one of the big reasons that I wanted to avoid these guys is that I just I had no idea how it was going to play out. We started to see more White and Murray together very late in the season. I mean, not a lot of it. It wasn't like game-changing amount of coincident gameplay. But over the last three weeks or so, Derek White was inside the top 60, playing about 26 minutes a game. He had 12 points, three boards, three assists, over a steal and a block a game. He was a 1-1-1 guy, and then good percentages in both. And that's the upside with Derek White. It's why a lot of people were willing to take a flyer on him this year because when he stepped into a bigger role last season, he was able to post 48% from the field and 78 at the free throw line and almost a block and over a steal. But the usage, the playing time, just wasn't there this season. And so again, he's a guy, I think, if you're looking for kind of that, that steady plodding, unless someone gets out of the way... I don't know that the Spurs dramatically alter their strategy next year. They're still going to have these, the Bryn Forbes types, the Patty Mills types that Greg Popovich is going to get in there because otherwise they'll have no floor spacing unless White figures out how to be a more consistent three-point shooter. And I don't, I don't really see that as a, a definite. Seems unlikely is all I'm saying. Maybe, I mean, you never know. But, you know, he's not a terribly high-usage guy. He needs the blocks, the steals to be very high to compensate for the fact that he's just not doing a whole lot of other stuff when he's not... I mean, he's like the fourth, fifth option on this team, if that. So, no, I don't, I don't think that I'm taking a flyer on Derek White. Unless something gets out of his way in the offseason, it becomes a much more clear path to 26-plus minutes a game. Uh, the 24 just wasn't getting it done despite those stretches where it looked like he was picking up. He had stretches where he was blocking like two or three shots a game, which is not insane, right? He's a pretty good shot-blocking guard, but not that. That's unsustainable. So I think the Spurs are actually going to have some values next year. They're, They're a quiet team that has been underperforming this season, I don't know how they can convince themselves to run this roster back because they just weren't that great even this year. But who knows? I mean, they might not have that many options. How badly do other teams want to trade a bunch of assets for Aldridge and or DeRozan? It's almost definitely rebuild time, but the question is, will they do it? So then you got all these other miscellaneous yahoos like Patty Mills and Jakob Pertl and Rudy Gay and Trey Lyles and Bryn Forbes. I thought Rudy Gay would play more minutes this year, only average 21 per game, which isn't going to be enough for him in, an, in any capacity. He's no longer fantasy relevant. Trey Lyles has a pretty clunky fantasy game where he's got to play about 40 minutes a game, which he did for a couple of games in there. Uh, Patty Mills, Bryn Forbes, those guys are both three-point shooters and nothing else. And then Jakob Pertl is your fill-in guy. You know, if Aldridge gets moved and no big men come back, Jakob Pertl becomes a very interesting fantasy name. But it would have to happen in the offseason for you to be able to draft him. I mean, he really has top 75 center upside if he's playing starters minutes. He's he's block specialist in a big way. Rebounds, field goal percent as well. Um, Otherwise, you're not going to sit on him with the hopes that Aldridge gets moved mid-season. He's a guy we'll talk about more, I think, next year. We're sort of watching. We're we're reading the tea leaves and listening to the breezes out of San Antonio. And I don't care about the rest of these guys. I know Lonnie Walker is an interesting young player, but again, guys really have to get out of their way for these dudes to move into a bigger role, and there are just too many names in the way. Now, again, if you start to see one, two, three guys get sent out of San Antonio, you make the adjustment. But right now, you assume most of this thing is a run-it-back type of roster. And in that case, Aldridge, probably going to be a little bit underdrafted. DeRozan, probably going to be a little bit underdrafted. And Jonte Murray, I don't know, but I'd certainly love to have him on my team next year. Love those guys that do all sorts of stuff. Big lesson to be taken away from San Antonio is don't mess with a situation that might be a timeshare. 
A lot of dudes overpaid for DeJounte Murray this year, assuming that he was just going to take the point guard job back, but he only averaged 25 minutes a game. If he averages 30 minutes a game, he's an unreal fantasy player. That might be next year. You might be looking at a top 50 guy next year. There should be buzz on his name. We'll see if there is. If there isn't, might be time to ring the cash register. Well, I'm glad, the, glad I got the internet working again over here. Managed to actually finish the, the podcast. We'll continue our Texas tour tomorrow. Only one of those teams left, so you can probably figure it out which one we're covering on our Thursday edition of Fantasy NBA Today. I'm Dan Vespers. Thanks again for listening, everybody. Have a great Wednesday. I want to get this bad boy out to you real quick now that the uh, my ability to upload files is back. Forgot to tweet yesterday that, again, we are continuing to look for salespeople. Even in the era of the COVID, this is time to make a move. This is not time to sit on your hands. Uh, to those of you who may have a bunch of time, perhaps you got furloughed, laid off, something like that, we have ways that you can get rolling with us. And, hell, by the time this whole thing is over, you might have a brand new career. So hit me up, at Dan Bespris on Twitter. We'll talk it through. Uh, I'll put a tweet out as well. And if you don't have Twitter, you can email teamhoopball at hoopdashball.com. Calm. You can probably hear the music going, which means we're close to done. Talk to you tomorrow. This has been a Hoop Bowl presentation.